Pardon the interruption. I am Sam Mulberry along with... I am Chris Garretts. And we are here to talk about Unit 3. This is our chance to kind of wrap up Unit 3, get you ready for your test. Um, so, Chris, Unit 3 goes really fast. There's lots of stuff. So we want to hit some big ideas. We're going to play a game of Food Chain, talk about who we think the five most important people are in Unit 3. But uh, to start with... Um, you know, as we look back at this unit, one of the things that we looked at was uh, a couple different time periods. So let's start from the most recent, the Enlightenment. Can you make the case as a European historian, Chris, why is the Enlightenment the most important time period we talk about in CWC? Yeah, and you know, students, you've, you've heard versions of this. Last time we were here, we were making the case for the Renaissance. I think probably there's, it should sound somewhat familiar. You know, the Renaissance is introducing this idea of individualism and optimizing human potential and maybe looking a little bit more to reason than to church authority or tradition. Um, there's some similarity. The big difference is that the Renaissance is all about looking backwards, right? Going to the sources, ad fontes. The Enlightenment is all about looking forward, you know, not being bound by the past, not looking to tradition or to authority figures. Yeah, that's why that contest it really is so striking. This notion that you should trust your own understanding, not any authority, not the past, not tradition, not the Greeks, not the medievals, not Luther, and and do this yourself. You know that that's a certain kind of individualism that we've become accustomed to. And so I think I'll probably say many times in this webisode, like things just seem more familiar, right? Like we're we're getting much closer to something more like our version of the West, and the Enlightenment moves us there, um, for better and for worse. You know, it, it, I think individualism is great. You know, we're liberating some people. Um, there are also some kind of uh, problems with the Enlightenment. It's it's not liberating everyone. We'll talk more about women. We'll talk about slavery along the way. And there, there's a danger that being liberated to be individuals can be de, can be uh, devastating for society. I and mean, we're detaching people from other kinds of communities and relationships. And, you know, maybe we need the help of the past or of tradition or authority figures sometimes. But I, I think it, it's definitely moving us more into the modern version of an individualistic West that values things like freedom, equality, human rights, and it has more optimistic view of human potential. Okay, so that, that's your introduction to the Enlightenment. Let's move just a little bit backward in time in our reverse chronological order. Sam, what does the Enlightenment have to do with the scientific revolution? Well, I, it, it comes down to the, that big, long, awkward title we had for the, the lecture where we talked about the scientific revolution, the Enlightenment. And, and you maybe just brushed over it because it was a long title, but it's changing concepts of knowledge and authority. We've been talking about authority and knowledge throughout this whole time, faith and reason, the authority of the church versus the authority of scripture. And what we see in the scientific revolution is another way to think about knowledge. Um, and so I'm going to, I'm going to, pose a question that I pose to, to all of my small groups that I think it's a movie we jump over really quick when we're talking about the scientific revolution. We talk about Copernicus putting forth the heliocentric model and how that's different than the geocentric model that we'd had for literally millennia. Um, and, I, and I always ask students, well, why did Copernicus propose heliocentrism? He's not doing it to be radical or different or to shake things up. He's doing it because there is data that doesn't match the, the geocentric model and the heliocentric model matches the data better. So this is a revolution in method about uh, method of how we come to know things, how we come to get to this knowledge. And this culminates with Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton is using the scientific method. He's using data. He's using experimentation and reason and math. And he comes up with a law of nature. You, law of universal gravitation is a law of nature. I'm going to give you a definition I gave to my students in small group. Universal principle, knowable through reason, that explain and predicts regularity in nature. Universally true, always true, no matter where you are, when you are. And um, it's knowable through reason. It's one thing to say those principles exist. It's another thing to say through reason, we can come to know them. And if we know them, we can harness them and we can use them to build technologies. We can use them to kind of manipulate the world in a particular kind of way. So, this leads to a mechanistic worldview. We think of the world like a machine rather than a living organism whose beating heart is God. So Newton is so important for this, right? That he leads to this shift. Now, we're, you asked me to connect this to the Enlightenment. So if we understand that about Newton, then all we have to do is go one step further. So Newton explains how the world works, how matter works through, through math and science and these things, and by putting forth this law of nature. 
people get enamored with that idea. They say, man, if Newton can do that in physics, maybe those exist in other areas in the sciences, right? So we see this explosion in science. But then people say, if Newton and other scientists can discover these laws of nature in the physical sciences, wouldn't it stand to reason that there may be laws of nature that, des that describe other aspects of life, politics, economics, society, religion, art, beauty, psychology, all of these questions, right? This, it, it, it stands to reason. And that's what the enlightenment is. The enlightenment is people saying, can we do what Newton did in the physical sciences in these other areas of life? And that is the dream of the enlightenment. It's the enlightenment project to describe everything through these knowable, rational, universal laws. So it grows right out of the scientific revolution and this new mechanistic worldview. How was that for a quick summary, Chris? I give you 10 out of 10 on that connection. Sam. All right. <laughs> it's a wordy, but I think you got it. All right. Um, Chris, one of the big things we, we talked about uh, most recently as we we're talking about the enlightenment in religion was this movement called pietism. Now, I'm always looking for experts to describe things. Do you know of anybody who we could look at who like really knows about pietism and could tell us about it? Guy, I, I hope we can find him, but there's this guy who writes these books about pietism and what it has to do with Bethel University. So we'll, we'll see if Chris Garrett can explain this a little bit. I mean, I don't really want to define it again. You've heard this in lecture. Uh, they're, they're short readings. They're easy to skip past, but do check out what we call collectively German pietists. Uh, so a little bit from Philip Jakob Spener, who's really the first pietist, and he has these kind of six basic principles. Most important of which is uh, that Christianity is not just belief, it's experience and practice. It's a lived faith, not just a thought faith. Um, but also Johanna Eleonora Peterson, who's a woman who breaks with Spainer, leads her own small group, teaches, preaches, because the way she reads the Bible, she feels like women are gifted just like men are. Um, so let me just tell you why I think pietism is so important. So first of all, kind of connecting back to what you just talked about, Sam, we could get the idea is this is like 1670s into like 1720s is the heyday of pietism. Oh, reason is taking over. There's no need for faith. There's no need for superstition or mystery or religion anymore, except that this is also a time of religious revival and renewal and awakening. And pietism is a big driver of that. And so it can seem almost contradictory, like, well, don't we have to pick reason or faith? But um, someone like John Wesley is a product of both. You know, and you read the sermon we give to you from him about faith and reason, he's trying to hold them in tension like Pascal is. He's been shaped by the pietists to think that there needs to be something more than just reason. And so he'll talk about faith, hope, and love. But he also went to Oxford in the middle of the Enlightenment, and he doesn't think that Christianity can simply dispense with reason itself. Uh, and so I think it's really interesting that you've got this kind of religious revival movement happening. Pietism kind of starts it, and then the Great Awakening takes it in lots of different directions. The second reason is I do think one of the big things that's happening for students right now is you're starting to hear your story a little bit more clearly. And maybe it was listening to Sam talk about science just now, and you heard your kind of STEM story. Uh, maybe it's when we start talking about politics or American history or, and you hear your story. Maybe it's, honestly, it's when we talk about empire and slavery. And tragically, that's kind of where you hear your family's distant story. But religiously, this is probably where most Bethel students are hearing their story. They're starting to hear something that sounds more like the churches they're accustomed to. And you're hearing about things like Christianity isn't just believing in a creed. It's having a conversion experience. It's having a relationship with God mediated through things like prayer and Bible study and small group kind of fellowship. Um, and it needs to be lived out, right? It, it leads to evangelism. It leads to teaching. It leads to all these kinds of activities for God's glory and our neighbor's good, as the pietist said. And as you hear around Bethel all the time, how many times has our new president said God's glory, neighbor's good? Uh, and so pietism directly inspires some churches, including the one that founds Bethel, my denomination, my home denomination, the Covenant Church, the E Free Church. But even if you just grew up like in any kind of evangelical church, non-denominational, evangelical Baptist, you probably heard those kind of ideas, right? Like Christianity requires a conversion experience and you know, a personal study of the Bible and living out your faith through evangelism and social action. That, that's coming from pietism, among other sources. Wow. That, is that the shortest I've ever said about pietism? <laughs> that was pretty good. Wow. I, I've said a lot more about pietism before, but I try to keep it in a nutshell. Uh, Sam, while we spent a lot of time on various Protestant reformations, 
most Europeans in the 16th century and really to this day stay in the Catholic Church. So to understand that, let me ask you this. What do you think, at least in the 16th century, was most appealing about Catholicism by contrast to the different kinds of Protestantism? I'm going to give you three quick reasons to think about why why Catholicism might have been attractive. The first one is that because the Catholic Church and the Catholic Reformation focuses on unity rather than purity, right? We need to keep the church unified. We don't want to break up the unity of the church. Unity helps lead to the at least the potential for diversity. And what I mean by that is if you're not going to break away and we're going to say this is all one Christian church, it leaves the door open to say, well, we can have this kind of spectrum of understanding. I can see this in my own experiences with Catholicism growing up in the late 20th century. Um, I can tell you I have seen Catholic, uh, devout Catholics who are as conservative as the most fundamentalist Protestant Christian. And I have I have lived with and, and, and worked with Catholic Christians who are as liberal as the most uh, liberation theology, like liberal Christians, and they're all part of the same church. So for one thing, unity helps to equal the, at least the potential for diversity and diversity in all kinds of different ways. Secondly, church tradition, like being open to the um, authority of the church and the, and the authority of the tradition of the church does provide a guide. It provides a guide and a check on you know, individuals reading scripture and how do we interpret that? So we're not all flying alone. We like, we have Augustine as our co-pilot when we read the Bible, we have Thomas Aquinas as our co-pilot when we read the Bible. Um, and I think that's a powerful thing to say, because it's scary to do this stuff on your own. If you're talking about the, you know, the, uh, the fate of your soul, you know, you might want to have some people who, who you can trust. And, um, there is this attraction to saying, well, I am, my views are in line with this, you know, thousand plus years of Christians who have read the scriptures and I'm reading it along with them. So I think that can be attractive. And then something that lives at the intersection of those first two points is the idea that I think if we're focusing on church tradition, we're focusing on unity. That also means that it, there's an emphasis on community over individuality. I mean, there is something about Martin Luther standing up and saying, you know, my conscience is captive of the word of God. Here I stand. I can do no other. That's a lot of I. And I think that there is this, there is within Catholicism, this sense of like, there, you're part of this much larger body. There's this emphasis on that. Now, there's lots of reasons why that's why all the things I'm saying are problematic. And I will, I will acknowledge that. But I think those are the, the reasons why it can sort of uh, be attractive in the 16th century. And it's a certain reason why it's attractive in the 21st century. I, I think all of those things also ring true there as well. Chris, um, the last exam comes on April 30th, but did you notice the semester doesn't end on April 30th? Oh, man. You're kidding yeah, me. we <laughs> we have a few more weeks. Can you give us a little preview of what's going to happen after exam three? Yeah, let me start at the very end and kind of work backwards because uh, CWC, I mean, there's finals week, right? And, and students, you might have final exams in other classes. We've already had you do three exams. You don't need to do a final exam in CWC. Instead, what we do is have you write a basically a take-home essay. Um, kind of like what you've done with the three application essays, but longer. Not super long, but maybe a thousand words, and you'll have about a week to work on it. Uh, and the purpose of that essay is, uh, you know, at least kind of twofold. We, we call it the synthesizing essay. To, to synthesize is to put together different kinds of pieces. We want you to be able to think back over the semester and, you know, draw from different readings, different time periods, but also then to put it in conversation with the present. And that's the kind of application idea. How do we take what we've been studying and think about its connections, its relevance to some contemporary issue of some sort? And so this changes every year. We Every year we kind of pick a different issue, scenario, debate, question. And because we started this year in the aftermath of the George Floyd killing and the protests, and, and we're winding up our year in the aftermath of the Chauvin trial, like it seemed like we should think about racial injustice and racial inequality in America. And so what we're going to do is we're, we're going to take a whole week and just set aside a couple of lectures and a small group and some additional readings to think a little bit about African-American history. And we've kind of started to hint at that at the end of the Enlightenment, talked about slavery, read from Equiano a little bit. Now we're going to really take this across the Atlantic to the United States and essentially do like a one week CWC version of the African-American story. So we'll kind of, I'll start, uh, I'll take us up from kind of the 18th century into the 19th. And then uh, Dr. Popkin will take us into the 20th century. 
And so I think what we want to think about is what are the roots of some of the problems that we've been observing and debating in this country? And I, I guess I, we'll talk a lot more about this in class, but let me just kind of um, suggest like that this wasn't solved, right, in 1863 with the Emancipation Proclamation or with Martin Luther King Jr. giving his I Have a Dream speech. Like there's, there's a kind of troubling continuity here and a kind of persistence to the problem that we want to think about. Where, where do these issues come from and how should the church, how should individual Christians respond? So we'll kind of stretch that out. We'll give you a week of essay to kind of fill in some context, some content, give you some more readings to think about. And then we'll, we'll, we'll just dedicate a week to helping you write the essay well. And we'll have a day in class, a lecture to set that up, small group to kind of brainstorm. You can talk with us outside of class, show us rough drafts, outlines. But we want you to end the, end the semester not just spitting back information to us, but giving your own opinion and engaging with a really difficult, you know, sometimes fraught, but really important question for uh, Americans, Westerners living in the 21st century uh, who are Christian. Okay, well, that, that's our quick sprint through Unit 3. Now let's take a different shot at this. After a break, we're going to play our favorite game, Food Chain, and talk about some of the most significant figures from uh, this uh, third unit of CWC. <laughs> All right, we are back. We are here for Food Chain. We're going to talk about the five most important figures from Unit 3. Chris, can you kick us off? Sure. I mean, Unit 3 is hard. It's actually the shortest unit, but there's such different stories in it. Like there's the Reformation, the Scientific Revolution, Enlightenment, and slavery, and uh, the development of feminism. So all that to say, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of start at the beginning and then move forward. And then at the very end, I might kind of go back in time a little bit, if that's all right. So let me start back in the 16th century with John Calvin. I always kind of want to include Calvin just as a counterbalance to the fact that I'm not a Calvinist. Like theologically, if you think in terms of um, views on predestination, foreknowledge, um, even sin to some extent, I'm uh, more in the Arminian kind of school. And you'll explore that when you get to like Christian theology class. And so for that reason, I want to bend over backwards to say how important John Calvin is, right? And how important it is to have a Protestant systematic theologian coming about a generation after Luther to kind of think through what Luther has unleashed and try to put the pieces together into a theological system that answers questions, that is based on scripture alone, but gives some structure and some order and um, some stability to Protestantism. Now, I don't agree with everything he says, but if you heard me in lecture in CMUD, you'll know that one of my favorite readings in the packet is this reading we give you from Calvin, which is really practical advice uh, rooted in powerful theology. We are not our own, we belong to God. Let all the parts of our lives strive toward him as their only appropriate end. And especially think about what you are called to be and what you're called to do. Um, that's such an important thing, I think, especially if you're early in college, you know, this is the moment you should be asking those questions and trying to hear your calling. So I guess I just want to tip my cap to John Calvin for giving us ways to think about that. Sam, who's your fifth? Well, as I was looking at my list, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of, I'll sort of, uh, tip my hand here a little bit and, and tell you something about my list. I didn't notice this till I had written the five names down, but my five names all share some geography. Um, so I am I am labeling this list England as a microcosm for Unit Three because I realized every person I have on my list is either from England or deeply attached to England in a particular kind of way. So at number five, I have John Wesley. Uh, in in our first segment, you talked about Pietism. Um, I love John Wesley. I think he's really, really important. Uh, and if we're thinking about England as our microcosm, Wesley is our figure of um, thinking about religious revival, thinking about that tension between faith and reason. I find Wesley deeply moving. And what's interesting is in that reading we have from Wesley, he upholds reason as important, but then he really um, kind of focuses in on faith. And for Wesley, faith is a uh, heart-centered faith. He is um, his... Uh, religion, his conversion story is attached to the story of pietism. So here we have the intersection of the Church of England and pietism, and it leads to uh, religious revivals, taking Christianity outside of the church, um, the, even the building of the church. Wesley goes out and preaches, tries to find the unchurched in England, preaches in uh, fields to farm workers, you know, um, preaches outside of mines as mine workers are coming in, are coming out of their, out of the mines, preaching in city squares, preaching wherever anyone will find him. Um, and and I, I, I find Wesley really important that way. And then 
the Methodist movement, uh, which was begun by Wesley, ends up becoming so central to American Christianity, to American frontier Christianity, um, to American Christianity's intersection with abolitionism. We see uh, the Wesleyan movement is so important there. Um, so I'm putting Wesley on my list at number five. Chris, who's your number four? Well, it's a good thing I picked some non-Englishmen then. Uh, my my number four is, uh, we, we'll call it Spain, but he's really a Basque from northern Spain, Ignatius Loyola. Um, and Sam, you partly made my case in, in the first segment when you talked about the appeal of Catholicism, because I think one thing Loyola is emphasizing as a response to the Protestant Reformation is the importance of tradition and church as a way of having unity. You know, and he says, you know, what I believe white, I'll believe black if the hierarchical church so defines or the reverse of it, whatever. It takes a while to unpack what he means until you think about all the seemingly black and white debates we're having in the 1540s and how hard it is to figure that out for yourself. You know, even if you believe in scripture alone, but which scripture and interpreted how and my neighbor and my family and my pastor disagree with me and what do I do? Maybe there's a kind of yieldedness or humility or submission or obedience to say, you know what, I, I would rather trust the church on this one because that will keep us together. And I can believe that that spirit that's been there since the Ten Commandments, since Pentecost, is still working in the church. The other thing I really appreciate about Loyola, and you know, in some ways, you know, kind of has something in common with Calvin. Here's someone who wants to build something, put religion in action. You know, I love the Jesuit idea of kind of putting the contemplative and the active together. You know, this is someone who believes in the importance of taking time for prayer and meditation and confession and worship, but all for the sake of service to others. Jesuit universities are created. Um, missionaries are sent around the world. And nowadays, Jesuits serve as everything from musicians to chemists to lawyers to social workers, right? I mean, as a pietist, I guess I love that sense of Christianity is not just belief. It's not just words you say or ideas you think about. It's it's something you live out in your personal relationship with God, in your relationship with others, and in your service to the world. And Jesuits have a really powerful notion of that. And it goes back to Ignatius Loyola. Who's number four for you, Sam? Uh, Chris, one of my one of the strengths of my list, although it's all England, is that it's not all dudes. Um <laughs> And if we're going to talk about England, we have to have at least one monarch on the list. Um, so I'm putting Queen Elizabeth the uh, first. Unbelievably important. Uh, there's lots of things I could say, but I want to focus in on what she does uh, in the religious turmoil of the 16th century in England. Uh, that her focus is on stability. How do we bring stability back to the throne, back to England? Um, and let's remember <laughs> her claim to the throne. She's the third member of her sibling group to become uh, to become monarch because a girl couldn't do it. And then she's not the firstborn. So so Henry doesn't think when he has daughters that, that they can bring stability and unity to England. And then we have Elizabeth who reigns for a very long time, a very powerful monarch. And she brings stability through focusing on unity. And she brings unity through compromise. So I think the Elizabethan compromise, it's one of my favorite stories in CWC. Somebody saying, I know that religion is so central, but can we find the pieces of religion that will unify the, the people under the cross instead of um, all of the sort of theological pieces that, that divide England? Um, so I, so I, I want to put Elizabeth there because I think I think that the Elizabethan compromise, you know, although it's going to, I mean, it's it's going to play into things that I love. It's going to pivot away from all of this doctrinal specificity that we see in your boy Calvin, and instead we're going to say, like, how can it's going to how how can Christianity unify us? And I, I love that. And then you know, if if I'm saying that uh, England is the world here in my list, you know, she's the one who really sets the stage for the British Empire for. All of its, all the pros and cons that we're going to see of that going forward. Um, Elizabeth is is such a powerful, important, uh, important leader that I want her on my list. Chris, who do you have at number three? Uh, well, I, I guess I have to talk about England at some point, right? I can't avoid it because it's the microcosm of the Western world. Uh, so let's talk about Isaac Newton. Actually, let's not say a lot more about Isaac Newton. Sam's already made this case pretty well. You've already been reminded of why Newton is so important to the scientific revolution, but also then it's kind of this hinge between the scientific revolution and the enlightenment. I mean, I, I just can't overstate how in 18th century England and other parts of Europe, intellectuals, poets, scientists, uh, educators, they're trying to just like live out Newton's principles in all areas of life, right? Whether it's in literature and economics and politics and education and criminology in the church, you know, they're just trying to find those, kind of what are some universal knowable 
um, principles that kind of not just explain human behavior, but we can harness to regulate human behavior and improve humanity. And it, it all goes back to Newton. Uh, and, and so I think we don't really need to say a lot more. I have a feeling he's going to show up on this all England list of yours, Sam. Is he number three? <laughs> he is not number three. Uh, but but the person I have at number three shares something with Newton, which is I think the, the things that I find really powerful in unit three are the paradigm shifts, are the people who... Um, are working at a particular moment either to lead a paradigm shift or to point out a paradigm shift. So I have I have John Locke at number three, um, and Locke really presents us with a political paradigm shift. I love that this unit starts with a reading about politics where we have Martin Luther, and it's one of those things where Luther's this great, I mean, we're talking about hinge figures. He's this great hinge figure that in lots of ways is pointing us towards the modern world in a particular kind of way, but at the same time is deeply medieval. And Luther's view of politics is deeply medieval, even though he's pretty revolutionary in terms of individual conscience and some of the things he's saying about church authority. Uh, and then we have Locke come along, and I love pairing Locke and Luther thinking about government. Um, and and because Locke is going to say, you know, government power is not this thing which is sacred and comes from on high, but it comes from the consent of the governed. He becomes the, his ideas become the basis for modern democracies, uh, becomes the fuel for political revolutions. Uh, students, if you are writing about John Locke, I want you to talk about the fact that he gives us a rational enlightenment justification for political revolutions, something that didn't really exist before. And Locke's going to provide us with that. And, and it's one of those great things where it's not just somebody talking about an ideas, but they're ideas that are then enacted in the 18th century. We see the French Revolution. We see the American Revolution as people taking this paradigm shift and saying, what would this look like if it really was played out? And we get some experiments in, uh, in politics and some experiments with democracies and experiments go in lots of different directions. Uh, but I think... I think Locke, uh, Locke is going to be there. And then the last thing about Locke is this focus on this idea of rights. Um, that is so central to the way, I mean, you were making the case that Unit 3 starts to look like a world we can understand. I think I think the focus on rights is a big part of that as well. Chris, who's at number two? Uh, John Locke? <laughs> <laughs> well, what can I say? Like, you're, you're absolutely right. I guess I just play some, uh, just a little bit. Higher. I mean, I'd, and I'd start with human rights. Uh, I don't teach it anymore, but we have a class in our department in political science called uh, Human Rights and International History. Uh, Andy Bramson teaches. It's a G class. You can take it for Gen Ed credit some year. And it, it really does start with Locke. You know, in, in many ways, like you can find older kind of religious origins of the idea that we're born with rights, but the language of natural, universal, inherent. You don't earn these rights. I mean, like in the Middle Ages, they have the language of rights, but it's something that your feudal lord bestows upon you or a city inherits or something. That's not what he's talking about. He just says, if you are a human, you have rights. And that shapes how we think about what it means to be human, right? For better and for worse. And I think mostly for better, we are rights-bearing creatures and the job of governments is to protect and enable those rights. Now, he doesn't extend this to all humans. And that's actually another reason I think he's really important because he points then to the downside of the Enlightenment, which is, you know, amid all this optimism and the sense of reason is going to show the way and all this knowledge is accessible and applicable, he is utterly blind to or unwilling to face the kind of inequality that is embedded in his notion of rights. For example, when I give the lecture on Enlightenment politics, I always mention that a young John Locke as a lawyer helped write the constitutions for the colonies of North and South Carolina. And uh, for example, he had to come up with some notion of why was it okay to then enslave people, right? Well, and he said, well, maybe Africans are not quite as reasonable as everyone else. Why is it okay, Europeans, to settle on land that belongs to people who are already there? Um, well, because they're not holding it as property. If you wonder why Locke is so committed to property rights being so central, it's partly because that's what his notion of European conquest rests on. Indigenous persons don't hold property. They just kind of squat on the land and move off. Europeans actually invest in it, right? Um, which is important, but it's a, it's a deeply problematic idea because it just enables the conquest and the extermination of, of, of a whole another civilization. And so for reasons good and bad, John Locke is hugely important to our story in Unit 3. Chris, you've got to stop doing my work for me. Um, there's a reason that Locke is number three on my list and not number two on my list. And although my list is all England, it at least is not all dudes and it at least is not all white dudes. Aluda Equiano, who is not from England, but lives in England and, and plays a major role in England. 
uh, is number two on my list. And you really set me up for this pretty, uh, pretty fantastically. Uh, the reason I have Equiano above Locke um, here is because why I think Equiano is so important is that he's combating you know, arguably one of the greatest evils of Western culture uh, and especially evils of Western culture in unit three. Um, and that is how the West goes out into the world and what it does out into the world. Uh, and especially that this age of enlightenment, as you point out, rests on the shoulders of enslaved people. Um, so what Equiano does when he publishes his autobiography is really shedding a bright light on the evils of the slave trade, on the realities of the slave trade. Um, I think it's so, it's so interesting to read, even in the short excerpt that we have, to read his, his part about the Middle Passage. And to just, like, like, you have to have your eye on that, that this is like somebody uh, shedding a spotlight on something that the people of England didn't want to know. And he's, he's forcing this into the conversation. And this book is a bestseller. And it is an integral part of the abolition of the slave trade in England is the work of Aluda Equiano. Um, so, so I want to put him there for combating that. Uh, and, and he's also just a great example of somebody who's using the tools of the Enlightenment. Some of these tools that are laid out by people like John Locke to actually critique the Enlightenment in the ways you were just talking about to say, how can we say this and still do this, you know. How how can we make these claims and do the things that we're doing? Um, so so I think Equiano is is really really important as somebody who is critical of, um, but also is a product of the Enlightenment in, in other ways too. So I so I think he is um, he's got to be on my list uh, if we're thinking about the whole scope of Unit Three, at least through the seen through the lens of England. <laughs> uh, Chris, who's your number one? All right. Well, having moved chronologically, you would think I'm going to wind up with like Voltaire or Jefferson or something, but I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning and say Martin Luther is number one. Now, I'm going to do this. And you might be saying, wait a minute, we spent like five minutes on Luther in unit three. We had this one reading on secular authority in the two kingdoms. Do I understand that right? I'm doing this partly because we always get to the end of unit two and we're not sure like, is, is, you know, we haven't really fully told Luther's story. We don't really know why he's significant. And so I just want to make up for the fact I probably didn't rank him high enough in unit two. And so here's my case for Martin Luther being most important. Almost everything else we talk about here is unleashed by Luther, responding to Luther, picking up on Luther. Um, you know, think about where I started with Calvin. There's no Calvin if there's not a Martin Luther, at least it's a very different Calvin. Uh, and by a different token, there's no Loyola if there's not Martin Luther, right? Like the, he does prompt a reckoning of uh, uh, Christians who want to reform the church from within, who, who want that tradition and unity and stability, but they also realize that there, there's a charge to be met here because of Luther. Um, I, I don't think I can credit him with unleashing the paradigm shift of the scientific revolution. That's a little too far, but think about where we end with Immanuel Kant, right? And in some ways, you know, kind of that ultimate outworking of the scientific method of the optimism of the enlightenment to say, trust your own understanding, dare to know, Right? Do the work, but also don't be cowardly. Break with the past. Reject creeds. Reject tradition. Reject church authority. Um, Kant is a Lutheran, and while I don't think Martin Luther would necessarily want to claim him as a Lutheran, he is the ultimate heir to Martin Luther's notion of, my conscience is captive. Now, Luther will add to the word of God. I don't know if Kant would believe that, but here I stand. I can do no other. Right? As you said earlier, Sam, there are all sorts of eyes in that statement. Luther is saying, trust your own understanding dare to know, right? And he can't help it that later generations will either disagree with him on how scripture will shape your conscience or just discard scripture altogether in shaping your con conscience and rest on reason alone. But he's the one who's unleashing that. And in so many ways, if we try to make sense of what are the threads kind of holding together this short but really complicated unit, I think it does go back to Martin Luther. And I'm not even talking about like the two kingdoms yet, which set up lots of other horrible things. Uh, but we can talk about Nazism some other time. Sam, who's your number one? I think this one's obvious. If we're thinking about England, we're thinking about everything we've talked about in this episode. Uh, this is this is Isaac Newton. I, I'm not. I'm just not even going to say anything more. Uh, it's and then I'm going to start to keep talking after I say I'm not going to say anything more. Uh, I just think he there's before it. It's one of those like before and afters. Like after Newton, the world. It's so hard to describe. The world is fundamentally different. I mean, it is a paradigm shift. And the fact that it happened so quickly and the fact that even in the moment people were saying, 
Newton has uncovered the language with which God has created the universe. It, 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 there, it's like there wasn't even a Europe didn't take a beat and they realized, oh, my gosh, this is this is now what it is. So, yeah, I, I think he's just so unbelievably important. And and I always tell students like I am such a product of the scientific revolution, even though I don't think of myself that way. I don't think of myself that thinks of the world through science and things like this is that the fact of the matter is I do. And Newton is plays such a huge role in that. Chris is England, the world. <laughs> it is not the it's, world. It's definitely more of, I mean, I think it's really good that you ended there because England hasn't played much of a role in our story. And then all of a sudden it's all over unit three. Right. And that is part of getting closer to our own story. And if you like take modern Europe with me, uh, this fall, like you'll see England is much more central to the story because of things Sam has already talked about here. All right. Well, that was fun, Sam. I, I don't know how we're going to decide the winner. I, I think I'm going to hand it to you because Newton clearly is the most important. <laughs> we're going to leave it for the people of England to vote. <laughs> Fair enough. They, they, they like doing that. Okay. We'll come back in just a minute to wrap things up for our Unit 3 episode. <laughs> Sam, we're running out of time on this webisode. Let's go to happy, happy time. You ready? I am. Okay, happy birthday to Prince Louis, the third child of Will and Kate. Fifth in line to the British throne. He turns three years old today. Sam, if the United States were to adopt a constitutional monarchy, what family would you install as the royals? And this could be fictional? It can be fictional. Okay, I'm not going to give a fictional answer. I have to actually have to start by saying I've never heard of Prince Louis, nor did I know that Will and Kate have three kids. Oh, I had no... Does that... <laughs> Wow, I didn't know that. Uh, um, you, know, you remember the story of Henry VIII, like the third kid who even pays attention. The second that's right. kid. <laughs> What's a third kid ever done in England? Uh, so, I thought if I wanted to be an agent of chaos, the fictional family I would I would make our uh, our monarchs would be the Bluth family from Arrested Development, just because that would leave us uh, no end of like tabloid journalism. So, but I don't actually want that. Um, so I was trying to think, you know the. Uh, the monarchs in it's really a figurehead position, you know, it's a, it's a head of state, but not head of government. So I'm trying to think of like, who has pretty, uh, universal appeals never going to happen, but, no. but, but who might be in range there. So I was thinking of the, uh, the Knowles Carter family seems like they would be like, they would be all right. So like, who's, who says no to Beyonce and Jay-Z. Plus I have a feeling that like blue Ivy Carter is cuter than Prince Louis. I don't know. <laughs> You know, well, students, you can look that up for yourself, but I think Sam's probably right about that. <laughs> All right, Chris, happy anniversary. Baseball at Wrigley Field first played on this day in 1914, not by the Cubs, but by the Chicago Whales of the short lived Federal League. Chris, how many baseball games do you think you'll attend this summer? Well, we were talking about this because you're going to a St. Saint Paul Saints game, and I really am excited about the Saints being the Triple A team for the Twins. So, I, I if we include that, I'll guess that we will go to. I'm going to say on the short side three. I mean, partly because I'm not really sure when I'll be willing to go back to the Twins. Um, I know my my son wants to go to a Saints game, so that might come first. Uh, a friend asked if we can go to a Twins game in August, so maybe one more. Like I usually do a Father's Day trip. I think it kind of depends, like how available are seats, how expensive are seats, and then how much do they kind of expand as the summer goes on? Vaccination rates go higher, but I also probably go to like three games normally. Like we don't have season tickets, so like when I say three, that's not like an abnormally small number of games. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with the over on this, Chris, because you're gonna find out that the Saints tickets are relatively cheap, and even in their first home stand, still seats available. So it might be if we throw the Saints in the mix. I think that's definitely definitely possible. Um, Sam, happy trails to. 30 degree temperatures. As of Monday, the long-term forecast I saw has us well above 50 from here on into May. Sam, is next week too early to start planting my garden? Chris, as a lifelong Minnesotan, I will say I don't trust Minnesota until May. So I want to tell you that, but you know what? I'm also a gambler, especially when it's with other people's money. So I'm going to say, I'm going to give you the all clear. Let's throw those plants in the ground. Go for it. I, I ask because we've got a neighbor across the street who's a farmer. He's actually got a Jolly Green Giant big cutout in his in his lawn, and they're having hip problems. So we've actually been gardening for them under COVID. And so I'm trying to decide, like, at what point do we kind of go over there, take out the rototiller, fertilize, and start putting down some of the spring vegetables. So 
I'm ready to go for it. I just need to get outside and do something. So early May sounds good to me. Students, remember that your test is coming up on Friday, April 30th, your last of three tests. You know the drill by now. Uh, check on Moodle and listen to announcements for the expanded TA office hours that are available. And of course, don't forget, read uh, the application essay assignment on your small group Moodle page and upload that before the exam starts. This is kind of a unique one, and I think a really interesting one. You have to do an interview and then reflect on the interview and connections uh, to others. So you can read more about that on Moodle. Uh, Sam, any final words of advice for students before they take this third test? You know what? You this is Since it's the third test, you know what you're going to see. You got this. Study hard. You're going to do great. All right. And hopefully this webisode has been helpful as kind of a last minute review, especially I think with like mastery terms, connections, you know. Uh, but, you know, you've done this before. Don't be nervous. Take your time and you'll do great. So thanks for listening to us. Uh, we will see you after the test to wrap up with the synthesizing essay. Until then, say goodnight, Stacey. Mm -hmm.